Hello, welcome back to History and Philosophy of Science. I'm Matt Brown, and today we're going to talk about the chemical revolution. I'm just going to give you a pretty short and sweet introduction to the, the topic, because I think our pieces uh, that we read by Paul Heunigen Huna and Hasek Chang for today are, are relatively straightforward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk just a little bit about the background of the chemical revolution. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about our two authors and just uh, give you an in, a introductory framing for their, for their essays. Okay. So first, the chemical revolution. So the chemical revolution takes place in the later part of the 18th century. Um, it is a sort of conflict or uh, uh, it, it features uh, the replacement of the older phlogiston theory um, or phlogiston theory uh, with the, the something like uh, what looks like modern chemistry um, a theory due to Lavoisier, the French chemist. So the phlogiston theory, um, it has its basis in 17th and 18th century uh, chemical research and practice, although it also has roots in ancient traditions. It's, it's a long state, like, like the, um, the geocentric or Ptolemaic model of the um, universe. It has its ancient roots. Um, the phlogiston theory is a family of theories of chemical change and it depends on basically the combination and separation of different elements and what are called principles. Um, this notion of principles is a little hard to understand from a modern point of view, but uh, in effect, a principle is um, something that when combined with a relatively inert element uh, generates some kind of, some kind of change or, or active property. Um, so principles are involved in uh, changes like combustion, uh, the creation of, of uh, things like acids and so on. Um, the phlogiston theory uh, is notable because it, it unified many types of chemical change under one form of explanation, right? So uh, apparently diverse kinds of things, um, combustion of organic uh, materials like the burning of wood, um, the combustion of uh, inorganic materials like uh, sulfur, um, as well as um, what was called calcinization, right, um, which is uh, a, a transformation from metal to a kind of ore and, and back again. Um, uh, we're all considered the same kind of process, and we still consider them to be the same kind of process today. That's something that was preserved by the new, by the modern theory. Now, um, Lavoisier's main um, innovation was to replace the notion of phlogiston with a principle he called oxygen. Oxygen literally meaning acid generator. He thought it was also involved in, in um, the creation of, of acidic uh, materials, acidic chemicals. But um, uh, the phlogiston theory um, explained combustion and calcinization as a matter of, of phlogiston leaving the material, right? And Lavoisier saw it as a matter of oxygen being gained by the material. That's one of the, that's the sort of main explanatory difference, right? And as we know later, um, although Lavoisier thought of oxygen as this principle, um, it would come to be thought of as, as an element like any other element. Now, there are various explanations um, in the historiography for why the field of chemistry switched from the phlogiston theory to the modern sort of paradigm. Um, uh, one of them has to do with uh, more refined quantitative measurements of the weights of materials in chemical change and a, and a greater emphasis on the relevant, on the, on the quantitative relationships of weights of materials. Um, so that's, that was a major part of it, but um, there's obviously a lot of 
uh, com complexities to the process and, and different historians explain it in different ways. The first article that you read for today is by Paul Hoenigan Huna. Um, Hoenigan Huna was a, was a colleague and, uh, and then a friend of both Kuhn and Feyerabend. Um, he wrote a, a systematic book on Kuhn's philosophy um, that, that is really important as an interpretation of Kuhn, understands Kuhn um, not as a kind of uh, irrationalist or, or proto-sociologist, but um, as an as a important philosophical thinker. Um, uh, Hunigan Huna also worked at Zurich with um, Feyerabend, um, and he wrote on themes like incommensurability that were of interest to both. Um, he's um, obviously younger, he was younger than them, um, uh, but to sort of carry on that mode of, of thought. And, and Hoenigen Huna um, gives a very standard Kuhnian interpretation of the chemical revolution in this paper. Um, that's, uh, uh, in, in, in some sense, actually, you might say, for, for Hoenigen Huna, the chemical revolution is the paradigm, or meta paradigm of a scientific revolution. Um, so one of the things that um, you know you, you might take away from uh, from Honig and Huna's piece is not only you know how we understand the chemical revolution um, as a paradigm shift, but also um, how Kuhn's own sort of study of the chemical revolution contributed to his whole overall theory of paradigms and revolutions. Hasek Chang's take on um, on the question is more is much more Feyerabendian. So Chang con considers himself a, a pluralist. Chang is really interested in how complex the construction of measurements is. Um, and in a lot of work, he kind of unpacks, uh, for example, in one of his books, he unpacks how we came up with the concept of temperature um, based on more intuitive notions of, of heat and cold and um, how we, we figured out how to measure it in a reliable way. Um, and he's really, he spends a lot of time investigating the kind of mutual dependence between ontology, theory, measuring tools and, and techniques, and, and what we consider to be the observational evidence. Chang's also one of the best living thinkers on the integration of history and philosophy of science together. Um, uh, on, on why and how history and philosophy in particular need to work together to critically understand science. Um, so, you know, despite sort of what we've read from Kuhn and Feyerabend and, and other ideas about why history and philosophy of science depend on one another, a lot of historians and philosophers of science today, you know, think of themselves as doing separate things. But Chang is a big advocate on their integration of the two. Now, in, in his piece, Chang shows, among other things, that Lavoisier's theory was a lot worse than we think of it as being today, and that the phlogiston theory actually had a lot going for it that was lost when the theory was rejected. A lot of modern concepts from chemistry that were in at least a kind of um, nascent or early form in the phlogiston theory that basically had to be rediscovered many decades or even over a century later. And Chang thinks maybe um, within the science, a better approach might have been a, a pluralism of chemical theories. And within the historiography of science, um, a plurality of approaches to how we think about uh, chemistry would also be helpful. The, the paper I had you read today, one of the reasons I included it among the many different things that Chang has written about, um, about the chemical revolution is that it has this really interesting reflection on the historiography of science. That is, um, he's thinking at a meta level, right, about how we tell the history of science, how we, how we construct and, and narrate the history of science. He argues, actually, 
that it's not Whigism, it's not Whig history, where we judge the past on the basis of the present because, you know, we, we kind of know better, right? We've learned more and we know better than they did in the past. But it's triumphalism, right? Where we celebrate the winners just because they're the winners, right? Of any scientific revolution or debate, irrespective of, of the actual performance of their, their theories and methods uh, according to current standards. So, you know, triumphalism and, and Whiggism can go together. He thinks actually this is a case where they come apart in some respects. Um, and this shows, he thinks, that triumphalism and Whiggism, um, you know, it's, it's really the triumphalism that is the problem for historians of science. There's a great quote about his um, alternative conception that I want to leave you with today at the end here. Um, he says, uh, a, Hasek Chang says, a straightforward and effective antidote to triumphalism is a sympathetic historiographical focus on the losers. We could adopt this as a methodological directive, pay particular attention to the losing side in a past scientific debate, and do your best to construct and understand it as a sensible alternative that unfortunately got dropped. You should learn a great deal from this exercise. And, and Chang himself has done this for a lot of different uh, ideas in the history of science that unfortunately got dropped. And he's actually gone so far as to reconstruct exper and conduct experiments based on old approaches, old paradigms, to demonstrate that they actually did get the experimental results that they got, which are puzzling from a contemporary point of view. Um, it's a very interesting work on batteries and um, some very interesting work on um, the radiation of cold rather than heat, right? Um, which doesn't make a lot of sense from our contemporary perspective. So that's my little introduction to the chemical revolution and our readings um, from Hoenig and Huna and Chang on the chemical revolution. Uh, I look forward to speaking with you in class today about those things. Um, please feel free to, uh, to respond to this video also in the Discord or in the comments section on the video. Um, and uh, otherwise, I will see you next time.